Good afternoon. According to a US-based management consulting firm, FMI, up to 90% of construction projects are either over budget or delayed. In 2007, President Beggy's cabinet approved 13 electricity projects that would cost our fiscus well over 200 billion rand. These projects included the two power stations, Midubi and Project Bravo, which was later renamed Gusile. The price tag for these projects were combined 163 billion and were meant to, to, to be completed by 2015. These two projects were expected to add 56% of generation capacity to ESCOM. The sad reality is that these two projects became a classic case of how not to deliver an infrastructure project. The completion date for Midupi was pushed to 2021 and Gusila to 2023. Project cost estimated ballooned by a whopping 177% to 402 billion. ESCOM has seen no less than 11 CEOs and acting CEOs the latest casualties being Paramani Hatev and Jabu Mabuz. Ironically, Kusilo means it's dawn or light. Maybe we should rename it again to Gusuile, which means dusk. ESCOM is not alone in failing to deliver projects within set timelines and budget. Our other projects include the Khao Train, which had an initial budget of 20 billion, but ended up costing the taxpayer over 50 billion. That was not all. This service cost the fiscus another 1.5 billion per annum, but only moves less than 1% of daily commuters. Who can forget the 2010 FIFA World Cup projects where stadiums were, which were initially budgeted for just about 5 billion, but ended up costing host cities over 30, 13 billion. Most of these stadiums are white elephants with little utilization on what they were built for. My name is Victor Khatebe and I'm your mod moderator for this session. I'd like to welcome you to the third episode of the Decade of the Drone webinar series. My day job is that of being a program director for Mzansi Drone Accelerator. We help early stage drone startups to close the traction gap in this highly competitive drone marketplace. I'm happy that one of our startup founders is in the speaker's panel. On Friday, he will be pitching to potential investors along with other 12 other 12 startups. This, when it, this webinar is brought to you proudly by DroneCon, Diesel Consulting, Commercial Drones, and in collaboration with African Construction Expo. Today, we move away from the contentious issues of drone surveillance and data security. Today's webinar is about the integration of drone technology in construction and infrastructure asset management. According to a global drone software company, Drone Deploy, construction is the leading sector in drone adoption with over 239% growth in 2019. Leading use cases include project progress tracking, early detection of problems, mapping of job sites, mitigation of dangerous working conditions, etc. Intervention of drone technology comes in what we call the four Ds of the drone industry. Whatever job that is dangerous, dirty, dull, dear, we may have a drone for you. Today, we have a great lineup of speakers, the majority of whom are not drone experts. And that was the intention. We want to get a better handle of our client's pain points so that we do not design what we call SISPs, which is the solution in search of a problem. We will take a deep dive on what are the major causes of project failure and how drone technology is helping in this industry. We will also look at how to manage and maintain infrastructure assets. For housekeeping, fortunately, I do not have to point out the ablution facilities and give you evacuation procedures. Feel free to use the chat line below to uh, post your comments, questions, and also to engage privately uh, with any of the speakers or attendees. What we cannot answer here, we will get back to you before the end of the week. Without much further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Marco Macagnano. Okay, just like in lasagna. Marco holds, a 40, holds uh, over 14 years experience leading architectural design, project delivery across most sectors uh, with specialized expertise in building information, modeling, 
the so-called BIM and Sustainable Development. Marco is the Director of Green Building Council of South Africa and a member of the advisory board to the University of Pretoria's Department of Architecture. His doctorate, which he got in 2018, focuses on evolving built environment, processes and products to adapt to Industry 4.0, create agile, smart, sustainable built environments. This research establishes a revised model for sustainable, sustainable development and an integrated systems design methodology for the built environment in the information age. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Dr. Marco Makanyan. Over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I speak to you in my capacity as a, a smart real estate and smart cities leader for Deloitte as well. I'm going to sh uh, see, um, I'm not able to share my screen. I think there's a permission that- uh, Okay, okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's sort that one out. Okay. While that, uh, while that occurs. Um, so my role uh, with uh, Deloitte is to think about the future of the built environment in a way that uh, creates new opportunity for what is a traditional sector in uh, the information age. How are we using data to our best advantage? What are we doing to create the connected environments uh, that allow for um, an advancement in the way that our, um, uh, sorry about this, I see. Are you uh, able to- Too many windows open. <laughs> Let me know if you can see that. That allow for enhancements in the way that we use and, uh, and interact with our, our physical environment. So we're looking at uh, um, creation of intelligent buildings, with smart uh, facilities management, predictive maintenance, uh, smart, uh, smart and sustainable cities, as well as even thinking towards um, how we are re-entering our built environments now that we're engaging ourselves in uh, a new COVID reality. So what we call the uh, respond, recover and thrive phase um, and uh, the impact that this has had on, uh, on the way in which we use our spaces and in actual fact intend to, to rely on our spaces in a different way for the new normal uh, now that we are within a new era. So if we were to summarize what uh, smart uh, real estate really is about and to provide a little bit of context in terms of the angle that I'm taking with regards to this discussion, it's that smart buildings are digitally connected structures that combine optimized building and operational automation with intelligent space management to enhance user experience, increase productivity, reduce costs, and mitigate physical and cybersecurity risks. So you can see it's quite a mouthful. Now, what this is essentially talking about now is that we have to reconsider our approach to the built environment, not as things we build, but as the creation of living and, uh, and, and intelligent systems. Systems that never turn off, systems that can self-diagnose. And that process is as true for the, uh, the, the process of uh, construction and the creation of these assets as it is for the operations in the life cycle. Now, when we think about smart real estate and construction, um, what we talk about in Deloitte is uh, we've got a number of catchphrases, but can you imagine asset performance that is uninterrupted and continuously improving? We'll talk, that's the, 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 the response we're taking with regards to thinking about our built environment is consistent in terms of this information feedback loops. So from the moment we start laying bricks on site to the moment that people occupy our spaces, these environments that we're interacting with need to be able to tell us that we're actually doing a good job of either building them or occupying them or running them. Um, if they're not doing that, they're not seen as a, uh, as a component which is conducive to business success. They're in fact an obstacle uh, to allowing us to get the best out of, our, um, out of our processes. So at Deloitte, we can imagine that future. Uh, we think about uh, the application of technology and uh, the built environment in a number of ways to en enable the, the creation of autonomous environments. So not just um, doors that open automatically as you walk up to them, we're looking at triggers that are, that are related to uh, employee and, uh, and occupant experience. Uh, we're looking at uh, processes within an intelligent building platform that are learning, uh, that are, have a, a, an a integration of cognitive processes that allow day two to be better than day one because this environment has now determined what constituted success and has improved upon those processes to, to reiterate upon itself. We're looking at a future of uh, intelligent asset management, which thinks about holistic life cycle. And of course, the application of drone technology as well as other IoT devices allows for real-time and continuous inspection. So what we're doing is we're creating a benchmark and then challenging ourselves in the execution of that, of that workflow to improve upon it on a day-to-day -day basis. Improving, moving the, uh, moving the line, moving the needle so that uh, today's successes represent tomorrow's minimum uh, standard for execution. 
Uh, in considering how uh, these technologies can be applied in the built environment, this allow, enables uh, such uh, capabilities such as full uh, lifecycle asset performance management and, uh, and, uh, and optimization. And of course, there's engineering workforce, so optimization, health and safety management, and environment management. And these are four key criteria that I think impact the construction sector most predominantly because effectively what we're talking about is getting the most out of activity, reducing wastage, reducing risk, and making sure that what we're doing is, comp uh, complacent, is, is complementary to, um, to an overall uh, holistic agenda, which is uh, uh, affecting the built environment and the sector in, 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 uh, in, a, in a larger degree. What we find when we're delivering projects to our clientele, be they uh, landlords, developers, or corporate tenants, um, that these companies also have very primarily uh, uh, new sustainable development goals that they're uh, aligning themselves to, corporate social responsibility guidelines. And in the way that we execute projects on their behalf as the facilitators of their future and the creation of these environments that are meant to house their futures uh, and successful businesses, we need to be complementary to those goals that they themselves are, are, are holding themselves accountable to. So that the process is as indicative of success as the product itself. And of course, through the introduction of these technologies through drones and other IoT devices, we've allowed, for example, the improvement of uh, fast asset inspections to a, a, to a tune of 10 times the increase in speed. And also it allows for the improvement of, uh, of workforce safety, which is now as important as ever, not just in the construction, but also the occupancy of these buildings, given the fact that we find ourselves in a new pandemic. So how do we do that? And essentially what we're talking about is establishing value in the data. We can't think about smart and we can't think about technology if we're not understanding what it is that these technologies are looking to accomplish. And when we've got a drone and when we've got a device or a sensor that, uh, that is there to help us understand our, our, our impact, what we're talking about is the ability to generate information and the ability to create actionable decision making. Now, when we speak about smart or intelligent, we're not talking about automated. Automated is sense a problem, you can see a problem is there and you treat it. And so that's a simple reactive response. But when we think about how to utilize this technology to be smart or intelligent, we're talking about becoming more predictive. So why did the problem occur? What is the risk that's uh, occurred as a result of that, uh, that, pr that problem uh, being brought to the fore? What contingencies can we put in place to deal with that problem so that uh, we can allow for business continuity to occur without having to draw everything to a stop? And then how can we learn from this experience to predict so that it never happens again and prepare for the likely uh, event that something else might occur of a similar nature? And that's when we talk, for example, the difference between responding to the new normal and preparing for the next normal. The use cases of this application of data is maintenance, it's an experience in terms of safety and productivity, as well as in operational efficiency. So if we're not using data to become more predictive in the way that we're, we're trying to solve for problems, to plan for contingencies and to create mechanisms to allow for business continuity, then we're not being smart just yet. We're being automated, we're being reactive. And that's the next echelon of, of, of capability that's brought forward by the introduction of these uh, types of technologies such as growing and growing and construction. And we'll unpack it a little bit further. So we talk about intelligent construction, we're talking about influencing the way that decisions are made input driven and integrative and predictive. We're looking about at how resources are managed to reduce risk, to reduce wastage, uh, and to, to really get to the bottom line uh, value that, uh, that an, an efficient process can, can, can accommodate. So smart automation based on capacity of resources, assets, and materials, optimization of very, uh, variable resources across the value chain and mining or construction, um, reduction in energy consumption, um, and the, the changing ways of work, of course. So the ways in which our workforce are deployed to site are in a constant flux. They're the most uh, uh, evolving component of a, of a project. So how then do we work uh, according to changing ways of work, changing skill sets, and changing technologies? And this is how value is created, in providing digital infrastructure to create scenario planning and to allow for a reduced risk outcome. You can't solve a problem if you don't understand it. And it's in curation and creation of this digital environment based on a, on a, on a basis of knowledge management and data-driven data, uh, data driven insights that we can actually curate the, the next generation of smart construction capabilities. So if we think about um, the pervasion of drones in terms of uh, construction, what we're seeing is the rapid uh, introduction of um, the ability to create an immense amount of data without the need to deploy physical infrastructure to site. So ordinarily you might think that you need to install smart cameras uh, or lay fiber cables or bring in sensors that can detect um, occupancy uh, densities or whatever it might be, 
what drones really allow us to do is to surround in a floating sense our environment with the capability to generate and collect data uh, seamlessly. So it's about rapid deployment. This allows for real-time monitoring and supervision. And of course, it, um, it allows for the opportunity to actually stitch in the physical environment to the digital environment uh, to allow for uh, knowledge and database sharing across cloud environments, for example, so multiple teams can coordinate on the same project simultaneously, irrespective of physical location. And now that we see work from home is becoming the norm, it's now entirely possible to manage a construction site from the comfort of your desk chair. So when we think about deploying IoT infrastructure from the sky, uh, without the need to lay cables or install new sensors, there's a whole host of things that are now becoming possible. For example, we can do very quick and efficient mapping and survey that uh, do away with the old systems of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, men on the ground or boots on the ground. We were able to map entire cities. And in fact, if you've ever used Google Earth or Apple Maps, the majority of these cities were done through the introduction of smart cameras linked to drones and helicopters. Uh, we can see on the bottom left construction monitoring and visual, visual inspections. So it's in identifying, in, in identifying through machine learning and cognitive processes attached to smart cameras whether or not the brick wall has been built in the right place, whether or not the speed or execution of construction is matching to project programs and timelines. And based upon that, you can create a situation whereby uh, it's possible to interpret whether or not the right workforce has been deployed to the, uh, to the right areas and understand where the gaps in the system have occurred. We're looking at PPE detection for uh, workforce safety. And of course, uh, the top right, the, uh, the moving graphic is what's possible with drones now. It's, it's, uh, using this uh, simple exercise of a game of football in a park to determine when people are getting too close to each other, which then creates a situation of uh, COVID-19 infection risk. So through smart cameras, it's possible now to really allow for a re-entry into the construction site very simply and very easily um, by getting ahead of the problem and providing the means to actually monitor uh, workforce in real time uh, to prevent uh, risk of spread. Uh, and we've even seen in uh, recent times uh, through the use of the police um, uh, or but in use of police uh, recently in the States is that um, facial recognition allied to PPE detection uh, is also being applied and even thermographic sensing for fever detection. Now, what's interesting about drone technology in construction is that it's such an important component to the creation of data and, and to the useful data, but we also want to think about how it can be applied in a broader ecosystem of IoT intelligence. So when we think about drones, but combined with a whole host of other ways to generate data, for example, in this use case, we should be on a mine. Uh, you're looking at a connected workforce, drones for inspection, um, IoT sensors, real-time data capture, equipment that's autonomous, uh, and remote operations that are um, uh, uh, um, managed and controlled through a digital control center off-site or on-site. Then it becomes an important uh, um, uh, ingredient into generating what we call an opportunity in the digital twin. So the digital twin is essentially a capability that means we can create a digitalized and virtualized version of reality that allows us to do a number of exciting things. So if we're able to scan a building in 3D or an environment in 3D and overlay it with a lot of information, both from drones and from the ground, we can create an evolving digital profile of an environment that allows us to do not only historic analysis, so in terms of what its progress or process efficiency was, we can also look at uh, the trends of performance uh, and how it's being built or operated um, to allow us to optimize business performance going forward. And what I mean by that is it, it allows us to do something uh, which is very exciting, which is called scenario planning. So if I create a version of a building or I create a, a view as to how this building is going to be constructed, that means then I can, I can create 50,000 or 5 million different versions of that construction process using artificial intelligence. Build it up over the course of one afternoon or a week, depending on the, uh, the, the power of your processor or your, your computer and identify of those 50,000 options, which one gets me to the point where I've built it most efficiently in the fastest amount of time with the greatest reduction of risk and, and wastage. And if you've got multiple projects that are happening at the same time, in which way can we sequence them so that the supply chain actually benefits the entire execution of projects along that roadmap? Um, so this uh, introduction of the digital twin means it's possible then to create an, number, an infinite number of those scenarios that mean you can get to the perfect resolution um, uh, of, uh, of uh, building, uh, a building process with a minimum amount of wastage. It's the same process, for example, that Formula One uh, uh, uses on their cars, where they create a virtualized version of the, uh, of the car and they run 50 different uh, iterations in terms of how the uh, aerodynamics need to work and then whichever one gives them the best result they go for and they implement. The same thing happens with the, the construction industry. So if you create a data environment that is rich, it allows the process of uh, scenario planning to occur. 
And then once you're in the process of actually uh, executing, you can create iterative improvements on that process through something called process bionics, which allows us then for, for example, in the laying of a brick, we do it one way to track how that brick was laid and then to make a suggestion the next day to do it maybe slightly differently to get a better result and to continue to do that until such a point that you just can't get any better. Oops, skipped ahead. So what that allows us to do is to diagnose historical events, get a real-time view in terms of what's happening right now to adapt in real time, as well as create scenarios for planning for the future. And by creating the ability on site through drones, for example, they can continually map progress. It means that we can actually create a much more intelligent and iterative uh, uh, approach towards scenario planning that allows for that perfect alignment of, uh, of data based against the human decision making. This allows for master planning, building simulation, scenario planning and analysis, as well as machine learning to create uh, um, uh, and extrapolate answers. We can apply it to light, climate, parametric model op optimization, value cost engineering, even um, carbon net neutrality on site. And uh, we also have the capability of incorporating into other um, uh, um, digital control center capabilities, such as one that we've got called City Synergy, that allows not just for the execution of projects, but for the monitoring of those projects once they've been completed, so that when an incident is, uh, is reported upon, we can actually understand what the implications across the, the overall um, uh, ecosystem uh, is. So uh, uh, a light going out in one area means that waste can't be collected, means that the load, uh, means that delivery can't occur, means that people can't get have access to, to site in certain areas. So there's a trickle down effect of, um, of delay. And it's getting ahead of those problems where really the, the, the value can be added. And then of course, in the scenario planning relating to um, uh, real time understanding across a broader portfolio. So if you've got multiple projects going at one time, you can actually attend to those quickly and efficiently. So that's my, my 10 cents worth. I hope it wasn't too much content in, in, too, little, in, too, in too little time. I'm happy to take any comments or alternatively take questions at the end of the session. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Marco. Uh, it was a very, very insightful presentation. Uh, we'll get back to you as far as when it comes to issues relating to full life cycle of an asset performance and also improving workforce safety. There's this issue of uh, uh, they can't now hours, man hours in at risk you know, in a, in, a, in a construction environment. Whilst I allow Gift to load his presentation, uh, I'd like to welcome, um, um, I think we've got Khalid from Egypt. Um, good afternoon, Khalid, and also uh, Ridwan from Indonesia. We welcome you guys um, uh, into this webinar. It's great to, to have you guys. Anyone from outside of South Africa, please greet us on the chat line. We'd like to uh, be able to uh, know that this uh, webinar is reaching people outside of this country. Great, our next speaker is a young man. Um, uh, I think today we've got a great lineup. We've got youth, we've got beauty. Um, gift a young man, uh, obviously in honor of the class of 1976, given the fact that uh, we are in the youth month. Gift has 10 years experience, young as he is, he's got 10 years experience in the aviation industry and holds four various aviation licenses from manned to unmanned licenses. I don't know, we've got to come up, come up with a term like manned or unmanned, okay. Um, he's an experienced pilot with more than 200 flying hours in unmanned aerial systems, most of which were accumulated from flying anti-poaching operations in national parks in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Gibbs also serves as a council member of Aeronautical Society of South Africa and is the general secretary of Wonders of Aviation. He's currently the founder of uh, and CEO of Nafasi Azangani, which specializes in drone data acquisition, processing analytics. Nafasi se serves the con construction and energy sector. Over to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Khadima, can we see, can you, can you show your video? Okay, is my video coming through? Yes, we can see you. And I trust that I'm audible. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Bob Victor. Much, much appreciated. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm actually really delighted to be here today as, as one of the panel speakers and to share some insights uh, in terms of what drone technology has to play in the smart construction industry. But before I actually get started, I'd like to share a profound quotes uh, that are shared by the chairman um, of 
XPRIZE Foundation, Peter Diamandis, who once said that in the next decade, there are going to be two kinds of businesses, uh, or two kinds of companies rather, that are using AI and those that are bankrupt. And so Nafasa Zangani was actually established in 2018 to assist companies to be able to harness, to be able sorry. to harness the future technologies. Give, sorry. Um, yeah. Can you just put your presentation on presentation mode? Uh, okay. Is it not so it's on presentation think... mode on my side? Yeah, uh, on your side. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not on our side. Uh, funny enough, maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> And now, is it uh, on presentation mode? No, it's not on presentation mode. Okay. That's rather peculiar. Okay, I'll just stop the share and then I'll just uh, share again. Maybe that will help. Okay, and then I'll just stop the share quickly. And. Okay, and about now, is it uh, showing in presentation mode? No, it's not. Uh, I'll tell you what, go ahead, um, we'll try and follow your slides because I think it's your settings on your, on your machine. And uh, okay. we'll try and move it to slideshow, the button, the fourth button on your right at the bottom. Yeah, it's, I am pressing that. On my side, it's showing as though it is on presentation, uh, but okay, it's some not weird reason. from our side. Yeah. Which is okay. rather peculiar. It's fine. We just go okay. ahead and just close the panel there on the top that go to the X there. Okay. Just close yeah, that. Yes, yeah, it's fine. that's better. Okay. Thank you. All right. Much. Sorry about that and the technical issues, but I'll I'll, I'll continue nonetheless. Um, and so and a study was actually conducted by Royal Concier that actually did a survey amongst uh, construction professionals. And it found that some of the main disrupting technologies that are going to be uh, a huge disruptor in the construction space is gold, gold information modeling, which essentially means that you actually build virtually before you even start to break ground. Uh, then they also found that basic data anal analytics is also gonna play quite uh, an instrumental role in actually assisting the construction professionals to be able to improve their workflows and their efficiencies ultimately. And they're not also forgetting that project management information systems, which play a huge role because in most cases, there's quite a lot of people who are involved in various construction projects. And for them to be able to be communicate effectively and for the project manager to be able to monitor them effectively plays quite an instrumental role as well. They also found that mobile platforms as well are also going to be a huge disruptor uh, because everyone has got a mobile device these days. And so once they actually have a mobile device these days, it's also a tool that can become a, a, a game changer in the construction space. And also touching a lot on today's discussion about drones, they also found that drones are going to be one of the key, key, key technologies that are also gonna play a role in assisting in the construction space. And so before I actually get into the crux of my presentation, uh, there's also another profound quote that was shared by Peter Drucker. He said that you can't manage what you can't measure. And that's quite, quite, quite profound, um, actually, when we're speaking about how do you harness the, the data and measure what is actually happening on the construction side. And so my, 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 my presentation today, I'd just like to outline some of the applications that we can find and how drones play an instrumental role uh, in, in assisting in the construction space. And so, Companies like Nafasi, as well as my colleagues, uh, such as Shibu's Construction and Pragmatic Master, are actually revolutionizing the way that construction professionals work and collaborate ultimately on construction projects. And so our aim essentially is to assist them um, in the as built monitoring, where uh, project overruns are a thing of the past. Infrastructure management, once the infrastructure has been delivered, how do you optimize and make sure that the asset is used to its full capacity without there being any wastage? And how do you stay ahead of the deterioration curve and make sure that the, the, the actual physical asset is at its best? And also data processing as well. Uh, data processing, we know that these days data is the gold mine and, and, and therefore you must be able to actually manage this data properly and process the data properly and have a full understanding of the data so that you can be able to derive prescriptive as well as descriptive analysis from the whole data set. And so if we, 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 we necessarily cannot actually do construction the way that we've been doing it uh, in the past, 
because we will have such projects as Mojubi and Kusile. And therefore, it goes without saying that the construction sector needs a change and drone technology is one of the key uh, disruptors that can enable that change and also enable that construction projects are delivered on time and therefore there aren't any cost overruns. So the as built monitoring, I'll just cover some of the applications which are very quite feasible uh, in terms of assisting and making sure that as the project is actually going on, the, all of the stakeholder uh, holders that are involved, how can they actually harness this drone data and this drone technology to be able to actually work efficiently together? We look at earthwork management, you know, how do you understand from the moment that the ground is being broken, how do you understand that um, so that your scheduling can become even much more better and you can actually make sure that all of the assets that you have on site are utilized to its full potential and you don't have any dormant assets lying around and not being used. 3D volumetric analysis is, it allows the project manager to be able to verify billing as well as any materials that are on site by quickly doing a 3D volumetric analysis of all the materials on site. And this is a much, much more quicker way than the conventional or rather the traditional methods of using a server, a surveyor or a quantity surveyor to actually calculate the stockpiles of materials that are on site. Visualizing projects as well has become even much, much more easier in terms of that now you are able to actually juxtapose what the previous um, week's construction project or the progress rather looked like and you can compare it with this week and have a better understanding of what has changed, how it's changed and how much it's changed by. And also another key important factor is the fact that you can now be actually able to catch any deviations earlier on uh, so that they don't become a expensive, expensive exercise to fix later on. And therefore you can actually take the original plans and overlay them with what's actually on site to have a better understanding and, 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 and to catch deviations from the early on stage. And all of these applications can actually be uh, derived in a very simple step. It's not a complicated process as we find that now the technologies as well as um, some of the platforms that are out there make it a much more seamless operation for you to derive all of that information. If, uh, so in, in, in most instances and how it also works for us at Nafasti is we would catch the data. So we would send out the uh, qualified personnel or a pilot, for instance, to actually go capture the required data. I have to say that anyone can fly a drone, but not everyone can capture data. And therefore, that is quite the critical part of it. So you need to make sure that when you uh, do get uh, some of these drone companies, they have a full understanding of how to capture the data so that they can use the data properly once it's processed. And in the processing step, it just takes about uh, updating the common data environments. And that's what we use at Nafasi, which is a, essentially a platform that allows all of the stakeholders to tap in. And once all the stakeholders can tap into the common data environment, they're able to derive only information or data files that are applicable to them. And once the processing has been complete, it's just a simple step of uh, the person going to download the data files that are applicable to them. And some of the data files are, um, you know, your OBJ, which comes in the form of a 3D model or your LAS. Uh, you can also download reports and also author photo maps along with videos. The data files are quite extensive and they're just not only limited to what I've specified here on the, pres on the presentation. Once the project has been complete, now it comes to the part of how do you actually make sure that drone technology plays a role in assisting you to actually uh, be able to effectively stay ahead of the deterioration curve. We understand that sometimes these days inspection costs can be very costly and drone data and drone technology has enabled that cost to come down because now in a typical roof inspection, you don't have to necessarily put up scaffolding to send people to walk up on the roof. You can just simply send up a drone. A drone can capture all the data. Once the data has been processed, you can pass it on to the civil engineer or you can pass it on to the, uh, to the inspection uh, engineer and they can actually be able to, from this data, have an understanding in terms of what's going on and then the, 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 um, the, the, the inspection becomes even much more targeted. So it is quite a risk factor if you're gonna be sending people up on the roof and if you do targeted inspections, it makes it much more easier. And also when it comes to maintaining asset registers, we know that, uh, for instance, there's a huge problem in some of the municipalities but not understanding what is on their portfolio in terms of buildings and what the current conditions are. 
And drone technology can play a huge role in assisting that by ensuring that the common data environment is updated on a regular basis. And therefore, you can understand what is on your portfolio and how to better uh, manage it, um, the, all the critical uh, assets on your portfolio. And you can schedule your maintenance plans way ahead of time. Instead of them becoming reactive, now you, they become even a much more proactive approach. It also works in a very similar way as the as built monitoring. It's a it's a, it's a it's a one two three step uh, 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 phase whereby it's just seamless. We all send out the the required personnel. They capture the data. We process the data, and at the end of the day, you're able to download the file the data files that are applicable to you. Data processing as well, which is quite a a, a, a another big one as well. Um, is at Nafasi, we enable clients who actually have their own uh, drones to be able to fly, but we understand that sometimes it's not uh, feasible to have all of the processing software, and that's where we come in in terms of assisting from the processing part of it, and as well as also doing the management part of it. Um, sometimes these projects can take over about 24 months, and you can collect even tons of amounts of data on a typical construction project, which just covers a year uh, less than. 20 hectares, if you're going to be flying on a weekly basis, you're looking at a huge storage uh, or rather a huge data files and therefore how do you ultimately store and manage this, uh, these data files properly. So that also becomes very critical because if you want to backdate and have an understanding of how it's progressing the construction project, you must have proper management, uh, data management systems uh, that are backing up the data and making sure that the data is backed up. And therefore, you must be able to access it from anywhere and from on, 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 on any device as well. It is also another simple uh, 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 seamless method as well, where you would upload your data. Once you upload your data and then companies like ours or companies like uh, Pragmatic Master or as well as Drone Deploy will do the rest and then they'll handle the data and then the only thing you wanna do is just probably download what you need when you need it. Uh, I, I have a couple of videos. I hope that my screen will allow me to, uh, for me to share uh, some of the practical methods that I've, I've outlined uh, in this presentation. And I will just quickly uh, try to share those videos with the whole audience. Okay, I hope my video is coming through. Um, so this video that's actually playing right now, uh, this is a sewer inspection or rather a, a, a sewer maintenance that was occurring out in, in Katakong and we were tasked to actually go and fly the whole area and what we were able to do is we're able to give the project manager a better understanding of what's happening on site and as well as from that data all of the other guys were able to plan and to have a better understanding of where to go next and how they can actually mitigate any risk that might be on site so with this uh 3d point cloud as you can see uh you're able to have a a um a, a workspace that you can annotate, you can measure, and you can do all of your measurements while sitting in the comfort of your office. You don't now have to go out to site and walk and do calculations and stuff like that. But just from a simple drone flight, you've got all of this power to be able to do all the necessary measurements as well as the planning from the comfort of your office. And then I'll just quickly share another video as well that touches on the volumetric analysis. Gone are the days now where you send someone to actually walk and try to look and eyeball how much material is on site. But now with drone data, a quick flight, you can be able to actually calculate the exact amount of volumes of material. Yes. Yeah. If there are no there are no videos. Video is not on. Okay. The video is not on, but maybe you can talk through it if it's not showing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, actually, um, so with a simple drone flight, we are able to actually uh, measure and calculate the exact amount of materials that are on site without necessarily having to send out a guy to actually walk. Uh, sorry that I, I wasn't able to, 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 to show the video footage. Is it still my presentation that's showing? You stop sharing the screen, so there's nothing on your screen. Okay. I want more. Uh, you, got, you got two minutes uh, gift just to wrap yeah. up. And uh, just for the sake of time, I'll just quickly uh, go through the rest of the presentation to make sure that we cover everything. Uh, and so these are some of the applications that drone technology can uh, essentially play a role in assisting uh, construction projects to be delivered on time. 
and therefore to be actually not incur any cost overruns. And also to assist as well as in the afterlife or once the project has been delivered, how do you ultimately uh, manage and maintain this infrastructure project or the, the critical asset rather uh, in, a, in, in, in a good manner. Some of the benefits uh, that we see from the drone technology is that there is a huge cost saving uh, in terms of inspections. And now you're able to actually uh, remotely monitor progress that's happening on site without physically having to be there on site. The data is easily accessible from anywhere and on any device as well. And what it also does is that it improves uh, efficient communication amongst the main stakeholders that are involved in the construction projects because now they're able to effectively communicate which mitigates some of the uh, downtime that happens in most construction projects. And now the project manager can also keep contractors accountable because now he's got verified data. He understands from an aerial perspective what is going on on site and therefore he can hold his contractors accountable. He can also verify the work that is being done in just a matter of seconds, as well as also verifying uh, verify billing. So these are some of the benefits that we find from drone technology and essentially just increases your, product, your, product, your productivity without compromising on any standards. Um, and so just for the audience of today, um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, you know, give it a start to those who might be interested in some of our technologies and some of what we're doing at NAFASI on your next construction project. Um, and you can just email us at info uh, at nafasi.co.za and you can just use a cone drone CON 2020 and we'll be more than willing to be able to assist you with your next construction project and ultimately help you harness some of these technologies that will effectively improve your workflows and make sure that your construction project is delivered on time and at a much more quicker pace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, GIFT. Um, that was awesome. And uh, please support GIFT. Um, yeah. I think uh, now if I can have all my panelists uh, turn on your videos and uh, now you can see the rest of our panelists. Our next speaker, um, we're now done with presentations. We're just now going to discuss these issues, the issues relating to projects. How, how do we make sure that we don't end up with failed projects? We, we've been having quite a number of failed projects and uh, we see some of the projects, whether it's BRT projects, a project has just been stalled. Um, is it because there was a project project uh, ran out of money? We just want to check all of those things. So our next speaker uh, panelist is a, a lady by the name of Nangam Somaponya. Nangam started a career at PIC in 2005. Uh, she's an independent in investment banking and project finance professional at DBSA. Uh, responsible for infrastructure projects within the transport, logistics and water sectors. She has also participated in project financing and monitoring of projects in broadband, oil and gas, student accommodation, maritime infrastructure, as well as fund of funds and private equity investment. A UDSA BCom gra honors graduate, she holds a, she holds a master's in de degree in finance and investment with London School of Business and Finance an MSc from Finance in Geneva Business uh, School and the Chartered Banker MBA with the Bangor University in Wales. She is also a Harvard Business School graduate having completed a GMP in 2019. Previously, she served as a member of Tafari Capital Board of Directors. Um, Nangam, so please introduce yourself and uh, also tell us about some of the exciting work you're doing. We know DBSA is also running with this with the city with the city's project city's support project for the eight metros and um, how for instance uh, are you guys uh, managing those projects because uh, from a financing point of view it must be worrying you guys that uh, projects uh, 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 project overruns just continues over to you Nox. thank you victor and good afternoon to all the audience members of the audience and to again to my fellow panelists. Um, my name is Nangam Somaponya and I am a Principal Investment Officer at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Yes, I'm responsible for transport and logistics and bulk water infrastructure. So just to give a background of what DBSA focuses on, one would wonder why this is an interesting um, conversation for the DBSA as an investor or a financier. DBSA is, is a development finance institution. We 
get involved in the value chain of infrastructure development and implementation. That includes the planning, preparation, financing, as well as implementation. So our core business is financing of infrastructure. However, understanding that before things get into financing, they have to be planned correctly, and then after financing, they have to be implemented correctly. So all those things are interrelated. So we, we participate within the value chain. And, and then the, the, the key sectors that we participate in being transport, ICT, um, health, so, um, health education, ICT, and water. So within those various sectors, you could think that um, we focus on the, the cash generating portion of it. But if you look at what then makes each infrastructure project viable, you find that there's other um, related infrastructure which does not necessarily directly relate to the cash flows of the business. But you need to have that related infrastructure in place before you can implement the, the core business. For example, if you're implementing a power plant, there's a power plant section. However, there's other infrastructure that is related to the development of the power plant itself. So what makes this interesting for us as the TBSA is that we do a lot of work with government, from national government, provincial, as well as municipalities. And part of the work we do is exactly the CSP program, the city support program that you've mentioned, Victor. In this area, we help municipalities in developing master plans for the cities and how they're going to develop and implement infrastructure, different types of infrastructure within the system. And our role is to make sure that things are, are, are costed correctly, they have a correct financing model, and they're implemented correctly. You deploy the correct strategies in place. So what makes, what makes the drone conversation quite interesting is that while we talk about intelligent construction and how we can solve for problems and manage risk within the construction environment, for us it's very important that we, we look at the drone infrastructure in how planning is done. Once you do the planning correctly, it's likely that the costing is, is close to reality as possible. And therefore, it means that the implementation is also close to reality as possible. But most importantly, the efficiency of the infrastructure is in the monitoring, is in the operation. So the monitoring of that infrastructure within the operation space is what we're struggling with in, in as far as municipal management according, in, in, um, around the infrastructure is concerned. So that's the biggest area for us in making sure that this kind of this, this type of infrastructure helps build infrastructure in a way that is cost effective, efficient, as well as safe for the for the government as well as for the users. So we we did um, there was a there was a mention around how we how we can use um, drone in, drones to identify risks and manage them. I mean, Gift mentioned a quote that says, you can't manage what you can't measure. And that's very important because before you look at management and, and, and problem solving and therefore risk management, you need to have made sure that things have been measured and identified and measured correctly. So municipalities have an issue, um, town planning is one of the things that they need to be focusing on and how they deploy infrastructure for the general society. It depends on how they plant their cities. And how cities are planned now is, is very important in that you, whatever, you, um, whatever infrastructure you provide, it needs to be used as efficiently as possible. So it means that you need to bring people close enough to where infrastructure is available. So when infrastructure is not available for certain groups of people, it makes it expensive for government to deploy it to areas that are more remote. So, so there's, there's, there's quite a lot of things that we can 
tap into in applying some technologies like zone technologies. So it's very important for us. One would ask, why, are the, why is a bank interested in improving the, employ, the deployment of infrastructure? Because if the, if the project, project sponsor says it costs one billion, they're gonna borrow one billion, we're gonna lend them one billion, and they're gonna give the money back. But that's not the point. The point of the DFI is that we advance and try to support the objectives of government. One of the reasons why infrastructure deployment is delayed is the availability of resources. In South Africa and generally in the continent, the availability of resources, and that the biggest component of that is the cost of implementing infrastructure. If there could be a way we can reduce the cost of implementing infrastructure and the time in which it, it gets deployed, we will go further in providing basic infrastructure within the country and the continent. That's my piece for now. Okay, thanks, thanks, Nangam. So we're going to come back to you, and uh, particularly in areas like uh, yes, you fund, but it's at some point because you need to account for the money. How do you do the audits? And uh, but my next speaker that I'm going to introduce now is a guy that uh, I work very closely with. Um, him and I uh, share the same offices in Woodmead. And uh, Ivan is an excellent example of a new generation of professionals who will continue to plan, design, and implement innovative solutions. As leading professional in uh, smart mobility, Ivan has a, Ivan has a, the ability to focus on the vision, take practical steps towards achieving it, and yet inspire and motivate the team that through a team-centric scenario, working together to achieve a desired outcome. Ivan's motivational style includes people to build strong networks, through his senior management role as associate director, he strives to, for optimum team performance, improve day-to-day -day efficiency as well as quality of the work environment. During his career, he has worked extensively with private and public sector clients and has successfully completed various projects in South Africa and Botswana, Australia and USA. He also pub published various technical articles in local and international magazines. Ivan holds a BSc degree in civil engineering obtained from University of Pretoria in 2002. He's registered as a professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa and he's also a member of South African Engin Institute of Civil, Engineer Civil Engineering. And Ivan also happens to be working for Royal Haskening and uh, in the transport space and uh, that is an area where he comes in and we understand Royal Haskening uh, as uh, is doing a lot of work within the smart uh, mobility environment. Ivan, introduce yourself and uh, talk briefly in terms of uh, how your smart infrastructure and smart mobility solutions within Royal Haskoning and within your understanding um, can have a, can create an opportunity for the drone technology. Up to you, sir. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, fellow panelists. And thank you for our audience joining us in, in uh, this uh, webinar. Now, uh, Victor, like you mentioned, um, after studying, the first uh, company that I worked with was actually a construction company. And the main reason was to see we as engineers design stuff. But how do you execute it? How do you build it? And it used to be when I started my career, when the boots hit the ground. Now these days, it's when the blades hits the air. And this is where it becomes interesting. Now, from, from a drone perspective, and what we try to do is work smarter, not harder give a better product to our client, better budget of, uh, to our client, and also better management of what's happening on site. And in our department in the Royal Ascona, as like you mentioned, is we've got various departments for myself, specializing in, in the transport section. And then we've got our infrastructure section, water sections, and so forth. And we drones and the technology behind it. And Marco, you mentioned the digital to inside of it and add that with the information and the data collection that Keith uh, mentioned. And combining those now, if you start now to look at the digital twin, you create, for instance, your building or your road network. Then you can go and then fly with your drones and scan, for instance, road pavement areas. Where there is there a crack in the road? And that small crack becomes a bottle. When can and how fast can you detect it? And for instance, your infrastructure uh, bridges. 
building that digital model of the bridge and now you have to look at the bottom of the bridge the anchors embankments and so forth you've got professional guys with lots of experience that can do those that are qualified for those types of inspections but now they need to get a, a mountain climbing course and do abseiling going down the bridge to go and inspect it and it becomes a costly and time consuming exercise now combining this with the technology you can go now and give them his team can go and fly it out that image it can be then sent in your to, to your digital twin that marco talked about and start adding that ai and then analyze it and then warn the uh, professional the specialist where certain specific investigations needs to happen and what's also nice is on demand uh, uh, um, ordering of materials on site so now you've got these drones you've got stockpile of materials on site be it for your road construction or bridge construction or whatever the case may be you evaluate these things with the drones you can measure how you quickly do you deplete your stockpiles and then on time ordering with better cash flow for you as a contractor as well as from the client side machinery on site I mean, if you uh, need an a, a excavator for a road project or a specific crane hire, for instance, a project that we're doing in Botswana now, these precast slabs and breach uh, sections is quite heavy. So you need a specialized crane to, to operate those. And you've got now three different bridges in various areas scattered all over Botswana. Now with the drone technology, you as the um, project manager and even client can be able to send out the drone to that specific site see if the train is actually operating are you still on time or is it is your equipment idling so for us from a, a, a engineering perspective and what we do and how we utilize these uh, drones and technology it took us to a way different step from just the pure digital twin side to the data collection side now combining everything with artificial artificial intelligence that ai component and at the end of the day, you can actually measure the real value add and cost to your client and investors in that project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, this is a, a great insight from you. I want to go back to Marco. And uh, <clears throat> Marco, you spoke about, uh, I know in this webinar, we're talking about not only the construction phase, but we're talking about the life cycle of a of a of a of a, a piece of infrastructure okay tell me about digital twinning say you build an infrastructure you can get the time sequence on a weekly basis what the progress has been but up until such time that you deliver the project and you say here's a project oh by the way here's the here's the digital image of the project what happens how do you maintain um a consistency and how will that digital twinning help you uh, manage this asset during its lifetime cycle and particularly with a view to uh, making sure that there's preventative maintenance so um yeah there's a number of ways in which it adds some value so in the construction per process uh, there was a, a couple of examples recently whereby digital twins were applied during construction to the point where they were able to shave about six weeks off of construction cost to the tune of millions of dollars that went in the pockets of the, uh, the contractors, which of course uh, made, uh, made their lives much easier. In a climate like today, where everybody's looking to consolidate and, um, and protect them themselves in a very volatile market, every uh, rand saved is um, to the benefit. And with regards to um, the operational life cycle, we can't predict the way that which buildings are definitely gonna be used. In fact, that's why I transitioned out of architecture into smart buildings because I could certainly design the way I thought an office building or a shopping center needed to work. But how do I know that the decision I take five years ago and the process it takes to build something to the point where people can actually walk in the door, the decisions I took back then are still representative of the market or the environment that we find ourselves in today. How do I know that the office building that was designed a couple of years ago is still uh, relevant to the way in which we work? And uh, interestingly, three months ago, had, it, had someone designed an office building, they would never have been, could have foreseen that, um, that the change in ways of work would have uh, come so quickly. So what the digital twin allows us to do is not just to create an, uh, an engine of reporting, whereby we can link 
a digitized version of a building to all of the sensors and the bits of data that are uh, that are in place in that, uh, in that space. It tells us how many people are in it, what the temperature is doing, how the different systems are performing, whether it's too hot, too cold, which lights are on, um, whether spaces are being cleaned, or uh, whether the security systems is, uh, is up to scratch. It's also telling us how the spaces are being used. And what that visual twin then allows us to do is, of course, if something were to alert and say something's gone off, we can go and fix it. But by sequencing in all the various systems and components that go into making this building a well-oiled machine, we can actually predict when things are going to, um, going to go wrong before they go wrong. So we can take steps to be preventative. Um, and uh, we can also, from that point of view, also understand the trends of usage that would impact maintenance. So for example, you might find that there's a prescriptive maintenance that's attached to air conditioning systems that you need to um, you know, deal with the filters every five years based on the warranty, but what if those spaces are only half occupied? And that means that the air conditioner is running at a lower, lower capacity, which means it can run for longer, which means you can essentially adjust the, the sequencing of your maintenance and save cost. Um, and the digital twin gives us the ability to forecast those situations. Plus it also puts us in a situation right now where we've got our own new building, Deloitte and Midrand, you know, we want to think ahead to what if we were to start to populate the building in October or November or December or February? What would it mean to our bottom line and what would it mean to our maintenance cycles? We can actually run those scenarios and see what happens. What would it mean to our, uh, our overheads? And uh, also maybe even empower us to take uh, better actions with regards to the way in which we sequence our re-entry as well. So it's, the power is in the scenario plan. It's in answering those what ifs. So the digital twin is essentially a place into which all the data goes and then we add the intelligence to the digital twin to, to give us the ability to look into the future and to give us that crystal ball approach. Uh, what if we put solar panels on our roof? Uh, uh, and what would that mean to our bottom line? And would it, would it necessarily be a, a, an investment worthwhile? Um, all these types of scenarios. So it, it puts the power of future predictability in our hands. Great. And um, by the way, Gift, please speak to Marco about us doing a digital of their building in, in Waterfall. Okay, Gift. <laughs> um, um, just want to come back to you, Gift. Uh, we've already spoken about the rate at which technology gets adopted. Okay. And uh, the technology adoption life cycle, um, particularly in Africa and South Africa, has been slow. Construction industry is a big industry. In the US, I mean, uh, 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 we're seeing growth of 239% uh, on the construction adoption rate and uh, about 42% of the whole of the construction companies in the US are trialing with drones in one way or the other. What will take South Africa gift? Uh, where do you believe there are still the hindrances for the adoption of this technology within the construction space and also just infrastructure asset management. Where do you see the, the, the hurdle is at the moment? And where are yeah, we as far as adoption? Yeah, of yeah that's, that's, that's such a great question that you actually pose. Um, and I, I think that, you know, one of the big hurdles actually is the fact that, um, you know, drones are regulated uh, in, from a South African perspective and they're regulated by the South African Civil Aviation Authority which oversees all and any operations that are done for commercial purposes. Uh, and that's also quite a, a, a huge hurdle in terms of the companies that do comply, uh, because now they have to make sure that they're compliant and it's quite an expensive exercise to do. Uh, and once you have your compliance, uh, it doesn't mean that now essentially you can access the market. Now accessing the market is now a huge, huge hurdle as well, because some of these uh, engineering firms they can just go buy a drone uh, and just essentially do it for themselves. And so it sidelines the companies that have invested, uh, you know, in, in, in making sure that they compliance. Uh, and, and, and we see this as quite a huge hurdle because uh, some of these companies, when you try to talk to them, they become uh, gatekeepers in the instance that they essentially want to fly their own drones internally. Uh, and so that's quite a huge problem. Uh, and not only that as well, but um, I might be also talking from a startup perspective or from a small company perspective, is we know that in South Africa, the construction space is, is, is played by, you know, elderly people. Uh, and if you're not a specific race or a specific age, then it becomes a challenge as well to be able to access the market. Um, and so these are some of the problems, not only, you know, uh, that, we're, uh, that's, that, that are experienced by, by us at NAFAS, but some of our colleagues as well, 
uh, within the drone accelerator program that we're in. Um, and, um, you know, in companies that invest in the right infrastructure and the right technology, uh, once they get access to markets, the technology has changed by then because we see that drones are actually changing in a matter of six months. You may buy a drone now, but six months later, there's something better. Um, and by holding on to that equipment and not utilizing it, it becomes a huge problem and it becomes a huge cost burden as well on, on, on the company as well. Uh, so those are just quite uh, a, a, a few of, of, of the problems or the hurdles that I can, I, I can attest to and talking from personal experience. Uh, and so we're hoping that, you know, it, it will change in the near future uh, and that, uh, you know, these engineering firms that are using drones internally, you know, uh, they will be held accountable by the Civil Aviation Authority that essentially is supposed to regulate flying of drones, uh, which is not being done. Uh, and it will open up the market and um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's all I can say for now. But uh, yeah, the future is bright and we're just hoping that, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the technology is adopted on a mass scale, uh, not only from the private sector, but as well as from the, um, from the public sector uh, in assisting municipalities, because municipalities, uh, they don't understand some of the critical infrastructure that they have. Uh, and what the state is of a critical infrastructure and drones can play a huge, huge role in assisting in that space. Right. Um, I know um, over 90% of uh, drone operations in South Africa are operated illegally. The unfortunate thing is that uh, people don't know what they don't know. And uh, some of it, uh, you find even government when they buy drone services, they don't know if a guy says, hey, here's my license. And that's okay. They don't. They think it's good. But I'm glad that uh, we've got companies like Royal Huskening who have decided that we're not going to dabble in that space. We'll work with companies like uh, Gives Company. Um, Sis Nangamso, coming back to you, um, uh, the issues that uh, you mentioned, particularly from an implementation point of view, we know that uh, government publishes every year this what they call DORA, you know, Division of uh, Revenue and make funding, which is municipal infrastructure grant. How does, if take the Auditor General, the Auditor General, here's the end of the financial year, they want to audit a particular piece of infrastructure. If the money that uh, you guys probably have given to the municipality, whether it has been used um, uh, properly. How does, I know Audit General likes, the, likes to audit fixed assets, you know, but how do they audit um, the percentage completion of a tower, of a, of a water reservoir, of a road, of all of those things? What is the approach from a, a, an AG's point of view? Or they just go there and say, oh, we think it's 80% and then they move on and they tick. Mm. How do they, would they rely on information like digital training that would say, hey, this is 80% complete and not um what what has been uh, uh, invoiced okay thanks that's that's quite an interesting point and it's luckily for 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 infrastructure planners and implementers you set your own objectives at the beginning of the year the auditors will audit you against what you said you will deliver and in most cases you will describe how you're going to measure that if you say, for example, I'm going to deliver 10 houses, a house with a roof on top is 10 houses, right? You can deliver 10 houses, the Auditor General will come and check if, if you said 10 houses. And if you said a house is a house that has windows, a door, and a roof, they will come and check if there are windows, if there's a door, if there's a roof. Whether there's a road to that house, is not what you contracted yourself to. Is that enough? Is it enough for you to have built that house and there's no one living in that house because there's no access to a school or there's no water into that house? So it becomes very tricky because the objectives of each institution are set by the institution themselves or they're driven by the mandate that institution has. So the auditors, the auditors will audit you against what you said you were delivered or what your mandate, what your mandate is. I'm, I'm using, the, I'm using the, the example of a house deliberately because government has gone into the strategy of building integrated human settlements, mm -hmm. which they called 
they call mega projects. That strategy is driven by the Department of Human Settlements. And the Department of Human Settlements um, started looking beyond providing a house, but started thinking how else do we provide amenities for people living in those houses. Okay. However, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for Auditor General to hold the Human Settlements Department accountable for a school that is not in that area or for a clinic that is not in that area. They will mm -hmm. hold them accountable for a house because okay. that's what they're supposed to build. And if they can prove at the end of the day that they've delivered a house, whether there's someone who lives in that house or whether the conditions of living in that house have been conducive, it's a different subject altogether. So we, try, we tend to get away with delivering efficient infrastructure for use by the general society because different, division, different departments are responsible for different parts of the, in the whole infrastructure. So this is an exciting subject for me because I am very involved in the mega project strategy. Okay. The DBSA is trying to um, facilitate the implementation of bulk infrastructure. Okay. So as much as we all in agreement that there needs to be a, in, an integrated human settlements approach, we still struggling as various um, government um, stakeholders with who takes what responsibility in making sure that this thing gets off the ground yeah. and it gets implemented in an integrated format. So mm -hmm. the bulk infrastructure component becomes the issue. So that's where DBSA is trying to come in and say, can we assist you facilitate the deployment and the financing of bulk infrastructure? Then all the various departments can come in. But the yeah. issue of Auditor General, um, um, entities, government departments or state-owned entities get measured against their own uh, plans in the beginning of the year. You submit an annual performance plan and you're going to be auditors will come and audit your financials, but again, uh, on the, in parallel to that, they will audit you against your very objectives that you set for yourself. So it doesn't mean they hold us accountable to delivering the right things, but they're holding us accountable to what we are promising to deliver at the end of the year. Okay, okay, great. Um, I think there are questions that are coming up and I'd like the panelists to also have a look at them. And uh, I know I can see Kim probably, uh, she misunderstood what you were saying, gift. Um, no, it's not the case, but uh, if you could just look at that when we come to the final round, I would like you guys to just answer some of those questions that, uh, uh, that you can see. Ivan, uh, you and I spoke about uh, issues relating to bill of material. We spoke about just in time uh, uh, in a construction site because the big issue in a construction site is having too, too much material and having too few material whereby uh, the progress of the construction could be stopped because you don't have the material. Okay. How could you be able on a daily basis? How would a drone, because in future we are flying drones, but uh, in today drones can fly themselves automatically. So you can have a, a set route on a daily basis to fly and they can be able to tell you. How would that technology assist given the fact that uh, when you're on the ground and uh, you probably don't know, you don't have a, a, a very good situational awareness view from the top to see exactly what is happening? How would that technology assist in that case, Ivan? Uh, thanks, thanks for, for that question, Victor. In terms of material on site and where you stockpile, you need to have environmental uh, authorization for that area and a specific site that you will stockpile it. So yeah. you will know exactly what that location is. So like you uh, uh, mentioned, you can ring fence it, you can geo fence it. You know that exact area. And that drone can then fly and monitor that area at a specific time of day. Say for instance, at seven o'clock in the morning, when your plant will go out to site, then before they actually get busy onto site, they, the, the drone can fly out and then measure via 3D point cloud scanning and, and or LIDAR data, whatever camera you put on it, measure that stockpile or that area 
that you will have your material on site. And that will give you a, basically a 3D image of that site and you will be able to quantify and measure the quantities and how you've depleted that stockpile. And then again, say later in the afternoon, um, when the plant or whatever return to the site camp, then that drone can fly out again and re-measure it again. And then you will have very accurate real-time data, what was there in the morning, what was there in the afternoon, and then see um, during that afternoon, do your planning, do I need to first in the following morning order new material on site? Was this specific site or specific area where material vanished overnight? So, uh, was the, uh, and then uh, as you get to the site in the next morning, you know there was some theft that might occur or whatever the case may be. So, these technologies from a day to day operation, security and advance warning can save you a lot of money. It can save you also in your cash flow. Because, like you stated, if you've got a lot of material on site, it's cash flow drain on the uh, client, on the contractor, and so forth. So now you can order the correct number of material at the correct time and manage your cash flow as well as tracking in your program. So you will know you've got a certain number of material or whatever your case may be to build a pipeline, to build a bridge, to build a, a skyscraper and that sort of thing. And now you can see how you cement your concrete and that sort of thing was depleted and based on your program, program what, what's the balance in between then? And did you achieve that equilibrium of material on site, your program, and cash flow? So it's all these that golden thread that links through it all, uh, throughout the line. And all these things are generated digitally. And you can also then generate your report digitally for your auditor general, for your financier, that they can see how the progress on site uh, is, is going. All right. No, th thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Um, we're now moving to closing remarks from each and every one of you. And uh, if, if you could please, uh, I'm just going to give you two minutes each. The first minute, if you could just look at some of the questions that have been asked. And uh, Gift, please respond to Clelin Pilo and uh, respond to Kim. But uh, if you could look at some of the questions that uh, are there, I would appreciate it. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go to you with the uh, both your closing remarks and but uh, also if you could give us a prediction as far as the future is concerned, particularly as it relates to 5G, because 5G, you can relate data on a real time basis at speed 100 times than what we have at the moment. Um, and then uh, in one minute and then in another minute, just have, make your closing remarks so that we can move forward. Yeah, I think for me, the most exciting component of 5G is, of course, the incredible amount of uh, capability of data transfer, which is going to not just improve our capabilities to, to do more with the data, but it's going to exponentially improve. Um, uh, it's going to probably improve our, our, our ability by a hundredfold. So it's really going to be amazing to see what the, what the possibilities are that lie ahead. I can't even imagine. Um, but what I also enjoy or uh, look forward to with regards to 5G is the improved capability for location-based services. It means that it's going to be possible for us to track ourselves and other components, asset manage, uh, asset inventory, um, down to a very granular level. And uh, what the amazing part of our location-based services really implies is that we can create triggered-based uh, events and, um, and uh, reactions. So. Uh, if someone goes to a place, uh, I move to near to a shopping center or I drive down, down the road and near to an office building, it can create a certain experience around my location uh, by virtue of the fact that we can get very granular. Um, and the same could be said for, for joint technologies as well, the, geo, um, the geographical mapping topographical surveys uh, linked to uh, smart cameras means that we can get very precise in terms of the location of certain features and events that we want to plot. And in terms of predictions for the future, I think the pervasion of, uh, of data transfer is going to be incredible. I think even from the point of view of we've got 5G coming, but we've also got uh, satellites being launched into space as we speak right now that are going to beam free internet down or very, very low cost internet down across the planet, which means the restrictions and constraints around physical infrastructure are going to be removed more and more every year that we progress. Um, the access to data uh, and the ability for everybody to become an information generating engine uh, not just from the point of view of cell phones in our pockets, but even just the reporting of experiences and even just the interactions between different devices in close proximity. 
our world is about to set foot in the course of the next couple of years into becoming a, a, an incredible data generating machine, the likes of which we can't even imagine. So um, yeah, watch the space. Uh, uh, and I think if we were to reconvene in one year time, we'll be talking about things that we couldn't have possibly predicted in, uh, in today's session. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much. And uh, gift over to you, just uh, in one minute, answer some of the questions and uh, give us your predictions. I mean, we talk about uh, uh, autonomous drones, we talk about uh, uh, drone swarms. Uh, what's going to happen? I mean, uh, are we going to be yeah, talking about uh, Thank you very much, Bob Victor. Um, so just to quickly clarify the point that I was making that uh, Kim asked the question in terms of can uh, engineering firms go purchase their own drones uh, and ultimately fly them without compliance with civil aviation authority rules? No, I was not saying that, but I was alluding to the fact that that's one of the hurdles where companies such as ours are trying to knock on some of these doors and access the market. But of course, since these companies are flying drones illegally, it makes it much more hard for us to make the sales because essentially they can just go to any store, buy a drone and fly their own operations without having to go through the civil aviation processes. So, you know, it's a responsibility that we must all take on as well as the um, construction professionals to make sure that they actually comply uh, to the civil aviation authority rules. And that company that are investing uh, their time as well as their expertise in flying do the job, which is essentially what it's meant for them to do. Uh, and so I just hope that I clarify that point uh, to Kim. Uh, but to also answer Kim Peter's question, which is, is, is quite a good question, uh, there are quite a number of facts that you have to consider uh, with flying a drone internally and in terms of what are you trying to achieve in terms of your scope. Uh, there are a couple of drones that uh, you can fly internally, but of course, such things as lighting, uh, no GPS internally uh, are some of the factors that you need to consider. Uh, and therefore, you must assess clearly what do you want to achieve uh, before you can even want to put a drone uh, inside a building. Uh, because in most cases, you can just essentially take a static camera or even sometimes uh, lay, uh, LiDAR scanners and scan the whole room and still get the same uh, amount of uh, data that you would need uh, from internally. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much excited about the future uh, in terms of what um, the, the uh, the, the, the drone opportunities are opening up in the industry. Uh, you know, we speak about, as you alluded to, uh, drone swarms, uh, autonomous drones. Uh, what we see as an AFASI is these technologies being used on every construction project uh, and just drones becoming a norm uh, and becoming a tool essentially that uh, construction projects cannot go without. Uh, and therefore the future is quite exciting uh, and I look forward to, to what lies ahead because it clearly is a decade of a drone. Thank you. Um, so are we going to be seeing a new construction boom? And if we see that construction boom, do you see the, the way we've delivered projects? Because uh, the way we've delivered projects, uh, some of them have been monumental failures. And um, how would technology in general, I'm going to talk about technology in general, will be able to assist entities like DBSA to be sure that uh, the money that is going into those projects is well spent. And I'm sure that it worries DBSA that most of the pro these projects are, they, they, they run over budget. Mm. And then also, also give us your closing remarks. Thank you for that question, Victor. All right. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, DBSA is, is a typical infrastructure in terms of brick and mortar financier. But over, be, um, over the past years, we have considered and also accepted that what, what is termed infrastructure keeps changes on a daily basis. I mean, 10 years ago, we would not have seen ourselves investing in fiber technology because we can't see ourselves touching it and be able to say, here, we're gonna take it, we're gonna put it there. <laughs> but today, fiber infrastructure is infrastructure. <laughs> so. So I, I see the conversation here is about how the drones can, can assist in implementing infrastructure. We, we're looking at them as supporting infrastructure. But again, if you think about it, drones themselves are infrastructure. If we take them as part of the infrastructure, as part of the ICT infrastructure, technology infrastructure, then we... we we, we're taking a different look at it and we're in, integrating it in everything that we are doing. The same way, the same way we, we've conducted um, business using technology that we haven't done before, it's the same way we need to evolve and do things 
bringing technology into into the fore. We, for example, we have seen a lot of um, decline in the construction the construction activity. The industry has seen a, a decline in the in the in recent past, and I don't think there has been a lot of introduction of technology in the construction space. We've seen green building, we've seen a lot of changes, changes that support environmental considerations and stuff like that. But how we build things, we've actually been building things the way we've been building them for, for a long time. So the introduction of technology in the construction space has been very slow, in my view. In that, let, let's give an example. If, if we've, built, we've been building a house, we're putting a brick over a brick over a brick for hundreds of years, is that you want to tell me that in 2020, there is no way of building all those social houses using a different technology that's going to get a house up in two days. And the reason why we are not there yet, it's because our mentality towards technology is that which gives puts us in a in a defensive mode that some of the things that we know that we've learned will be taken away from us there's no opportunity for us to be anything else now because our jobs will be taken away from us but if we expose ourselves to how we do things better and how the things that we do are meant to rather not focusing on us doing the work as the job but the, the things that we are doing, they're contributing to the lifestyle that we want to live. And if we want to put people in houses, how quickly can we do that? Can we use technology to quickly put people in houses instead of focusing on ourselves, creating a hundred jobs to create, to build a house? The purpose yeah. of a house is for someone to live in. It's not for somebody else to build it, right? So, so the tech, we should use the technology to be able to give ourselves the advantage of improving our lives. So I'm glad that we're having this conversation and I want to say drones are infrastructure. Yes, yeah. we're talking about drones being in support infrastructure, but drones are infrastructure and DBSA is very keen to have this facility, we have this uh, fascinating conversation and how infrastructure has changed and how we can support this type of initiatives to move things to the next level. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Nangam. So, um, uh, Ivan, they've left you just one minute. And uh, just from a, a Royal Haskelling point of view, where do you see this technology going? And, um, and uh, uh, what do you, what do you want to see from the drone industry? Just uh, those key issues as well. Uh, thanks, thanks for the detail. And um, yes, uh, one minute, I can, use, I can use an hour and a half for the closing comments on that question. <laughs> But in essence, I think it, it's, it's not anymore when or if and that sort of thing, it's what next. And for us especially is to concentrate on, say for instance, the, the digital twin and the data that Gift and his company is collecting for us. We're not in a data collecting business, but for us, it's the algorithms behind it. Yeah. So that imagery that Gift and his team is picking up, how can we analyze it, put the algorithm to it, and see what's the next maintenance or the maintenance, uh, maintenance or predictive maintenance and the warnings bells that needs to go off and that sort of thing. So for us, we will definitely see an uh, increase in using this technology. And the uh, appetite is growing more and more. Even in remote areas, we're busy now in, in Northwest province to look at the asset management and the asset register for the entire Northwest province road infrastructure and road network you know the number of kilometers of roads in, in there and you don't always have the uh, uh, internet connection or even uh, uh, the data connection from your mobile towers however the drones can go out they fly they review the road network and as soon as the, they go back to a guest house or as soon as they're in an area where there's uh, data available then this data can be started uploading to, to the cloud and then from there we start processing this data and then, then uh, come up with uh, maintenance scenarios and uh, asset predictions and that sort of thing. So for us, the technology will grow uh, fast. In terms of what we um, want from the drone and the drone companies, I think it's more 
a collaborative effort in a sense that different horses for different courses. Let the data companies, let the drone companies collect the data. We specialize in taking the data further and let the other company specializes in that. Um, it's, it's not worthwhile. We did the analysis for us as a Rolas Conan and we're an international company. Start purchasing our own drones, getting our own private and, and license, operating licenses, plus then get a license to operate drones because there's different stages of licensing from personal licenses to your company licenses and etc. So I think it's a collaborative effort of everyone in this webinar. Let's work together and hold hands and to go forward. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my panelists and everybody who attended. In me, my closing remarks is that uh, a drone is just but one of the tools in the toolbox. And uh, if you look at drone as a hammer, of course, everything will be a nail. And we're saying drones cannot do everything. And uh, I'm glad in this discussion, we spoke about the problems and the issues within the construction space and how we can solve those problems. We're not going to tell you how to run your construction projects, but at the very least, we can help you provide critical information and the actionable insights that will make sure that the projects don't go over, over budget and they don't get delayed. We don't want another Midupi and, uh, and the rolling blackouts. And on this note, I'd like to thank my panelists and I'd like to thank Candice at the back, who's the producer of this show, and everybody else uh, from France, from, from Lagos, uh, all, over the, all over the world who've attended uh, this webinar. And by the way, can I also apologize profusely? We have had to move from webcast back to Zoom and uh, it's a learning curve. Apologies, I know we've lost quite a number of people with that because we had to, we had to pivot in 24 hours and we really apologize for that. We're coming back to you in July with another topic that uh, we're, going, we're going to be able to announce in due course. And on this note, thank you very much and all the best and God bless. Thank you, thank Victor. You. Thank 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 you.